Welcome to the MMHP and the 989, channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history. Hello, Michigan music lovers. This is Scott Baker. I want to welcome you to the Michigan Music History Podcast. I am flanked by Michigan Music Royalty. To the left, Dr. J. To the right, Sir Fred. We cut from just around the block of the Michigan Rock Legends Hall of Fame in Bay City, Michigan, here at Studio 163 in Essexville. And now it's time to grab a favorite beverage, hit the cruise, and take a trip back with us through Michigan's rich music history. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric, Electric Kitsch, Kitsch, located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. And now, here's your host, Scott Baker. We're back here at Studio 163 in Essexville, Michigan. This is the Michigan Music History Podcast in our second season, and we just rolled our one-year mark, and we're celebrating here in March. And we have a very special guest coming in, and uh, he's played all around for so many years. He's one of the guys that's in a lot of different bands. And uh, I got to thank Mr. Fred Wright for putting this one together. And we have Mr. Don Steele in the house tonight. How are you doing? Great, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for yeah. being on here. And uh, also in the house tonight, we got Dr. J. Everything going smooth, doctor? Getting ready for that grand opening? Uh, we are complete. It's together, and we're <laughs> ready to roll on Saturday. Ooh, the grand opening right. for the Hall of Fame is on, and that is right around the block here from Essexville here on Washington Avenue. And uh, the um, museum here, the it's Bay County Museum. Historical Museum, museum of yes. Bay County, right next to the uh, City Hall building. So, Perfect. And yeah. that'll be this Saturday, and not that this is going to be broadcast in time, but uh, this is a pretty exciting thing. And that poster, oh my gosh, that poster. Yeah, Dennis Lauren... Uh, you know, renowned Detroit poster artists just caught me completely by surprise by designing that poster. I felt like a rock star. <laughs> I have my name on that one. Uh, so cool. Yeah. Well, we've got about we've got over a dozen of uh, Dennis's works up at the museum, and it just looks sensational. You know, he's got a very distinctive style. Uh, you know, for, you know, and that poster yeah. that he designed is very much in Dennis's wheelhouse. So oh, yeah, man. it's good. Sir Fred, how are you doing this week? I'm doing real good. Good. What's what's new on your platter over there? Do you find any new records or any new cool things? Well, I've been selling a lot. Have you? The recent um, gas price hike. It's yeah. the only thing I can think of. And all of a sudden, my record sales have gone up. <laughs> uh -huh. People are home listening. Yeah, it's finding the silver lining in that <laughs> gray cloud, uh, Sir Fred. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> And you uh you were still you're getting ready to wrap that book up or are you still doing edits or what's what time was uh, that? still doing edits and yeah. gathering new information wonderful okay like tonight well let, let me let you take off for the evening and start doing some talking to your buddy here so i'm gonna let you uh fire away at don well don is uh one of the early rock and roll guys and uh, his, I don't know, it wasn't your first group, the S-Styles, was it? I think you... Yeah, that was really my first group. The Strollers? Oh, that was in high school. Yeah, we had a group, and it was a, me playing guitar and four guys singing uh, behind oh, me. Oh, okay. And uh, one guy harmonized. The other ones were up there just for comfort zone. You know, I don't want to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> so is this a doo-wop group? Uh, uh, no, we did. Uh, he's got the whole world in his hands. Okay. Uh, we did... Uh, I did a Johnny Cash song uh, that he had written in 1957, and I thought it wouldn't go over at all because it was country and everybody was into rock and roll. Um, I got to think of the name of it, but uh, I put it on that recent album that I did for the Mustard Seed Shelter. And, um, uh, oh gosh, I'll think of it but right now. Well, um, so the Strollers would be, would you classify more as like a folk group? Because that was really popular in the 50s. We, and that, oh, I, we got, did things like Bye Bye Love. Uh, we, okay. we were kind of rock and roll, but yeah. we just had me playing guitar, and that uh, wasn't much of a show by itself. You know, <laughs> it, it was the first rock and roll group was the S-Styles, you know. Yeah. We, we formed that group at Central Michigan. Um, I had a full ride to the Air Force Academy, and then they find out I was colorblind, and you can't be a pilot or an officer. Oh, so okay. I ended up going to Central Michigan, and... Uh, played in sports one year and 
I always say in Saginaw, we had such good teams at St. Andrews that we had, you know, everybody in the crowd knew Don Steele and, and Bob Bredo and the guys who played. And at Central Michigan, when I played, I knew everybody in the stands. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I found that was a lot less. I found out why I played, you know, it was for the crowd, I guess. Yeah. Well, I was a Chippewa myself. So, oh, were you? Well, good. yes. All right. So I started Same a band you. there, and we were the first rock and roll band to play at the uh, uh, 19th hole. Uh, they called it the 19th hole because it was near the golf course, right. but it was a, a real dive. It was still popular when I went there. And, and now, it's, <laughs> now it's going strong yet. I mean, wow, that's great. Where, where were you before that? Where'd you grow up? John? I grew up right in Saginaw. So you, 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 everything came out of Saginaw, and then you went to CMU post high school. I went to Central Michigan and uh, did my undergraduate master's and did my doctorate at Ohio State. Wow. I left. I left Michigan to Ohio State. They water, they waterboard you when you get there to make sure you can leave. <laughs> right. I can only imagine how that went down. Yeah. yeah right. Did you Did you have a band going on that you took with you, or just kept strumming tunes? And it's funny. I I, I went into a, a club in uh, um, Columbus, Ohio. Jim Otis Steakhouse. Jim was a former player from Ohio State, and I was living at the time when I went there with John Brockington, who played uh, with with them. Uh, but he was still at Ohio State at that time, and uh, I walked. I walked in. I had a date. I went in, and the uh, band was Buzz Ashton, well, uh, Brian Ashton from here, <laughs> and we ended up playing together in a group later. But he called me up on stage like I was a superstar, and that I have to thank him for that evening. It moved me along on that date pretty well. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So you, were, how long were you at CMU playing gigs then? Um, I, it took me almost seven years to graduate because I kept leaving, mm -hmm. going on the road. We go to California, Las Vegas, places like that. Green Bay, we spent a lot, you know, played there two different, the first two Super Bowls, we, we were the band, the house band in Green Bay. And the that original started, Lombardi time. Yeah. We met Vince and then Jerry Kramer, who played with them, became my business partner. We've been partners for 40 years now. Wow. Well, that must have been quite an experience. That was, boy, they, that was the pinnacle of Green Bay football, right? It right was, at that it, time, it was amazing. We were supposed to go to the Veranda Lounge, I think it was in uh, Van Nuys, California. We're all none of us had traveled. We're really looking forward to the trip. And about a week before, we're standing in a foot of snow. It's November, in Michigan, and we're playing at the Fortney Hotel. And they gave us a call that the band had been extended, so they're going to drop us down in Green Bay. And that was a very disappointing, uh, like Green Bay. <laughs> yeah, so, instead of California. Yeah, they got three feet of snow. <laughs> so we go in there and we're setting up our equipment. And uh, I never saw so many beautiful women in one place in my life. It was just shocking to me. I mean, not that I had any premonitions about Green Bay, although I did. <laughs> um, it was uh, amazing. But then about 10 o'clock, all these football players came in. That was where the Packers hung out. Mm-hmm. And at that time, most of the Packers worked, their wives stayed home. And uh, so we went to all the games, sitting with those wives who were there, you know, because we'd have their extra tickets. But we played that first year, and then they won the Super Bowl, and we knew all the players and everything. And then the second year, we were in Vegas, and I told the guys, Green Bay had called, and they'd like us to come back. We went back, and they won it again. The third year, we didn't come back, and they uh, didn't win the Super Bowl. So I always hold that over Jerry. So you were the yeah. good luck charm. <laughs> That's right. You well, were... I remember watching those Super Bowls at CMU. You know, you, that was great. Do you remember Alex Karras? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I, I got to tell you, Jerry and I and Alex did a lot of speaking together, and I'd be the MC, And they hated each other. You know, they played right directly across each other for about 12 years. And uh, they, they got to be good friends. But I'll never forget one time. Uh, Alex was talking and he said uh, uh, quite a bit and then he said by the way Jerry Kramer was a great football player and if you don't believe that read his book it's called instant replay and Jerry just laughed and so Jerry got up there and he says you know Alex thank you for the compliment and he said uh, <laughs> he said you know uh, uh, Alex went to Iowa, but he was just there for two terms, uh, Eisenhower and Truman. Uh. And he said, I'm glad, I'm glad you quoted the book, but who read it to you? <laughs> so, so they would go back and forth with each other. Oh, gee, yeah, uh, that must have been a blast. Yeah, oh, man. Was. Well, uh, how did you hear about Art Scheel? You were, would have been going to Central Michigan we at came, this time? We came off the road. and. I remember Dick Wagner was a good friend. And, oh, sure. Uh, we were making three times the money anybody was making 
because we were playing good clubs, but we weren't recording. And we, we regret that to this day, that back then we should have recorded, but um, we didn't think about it that much. And uh, so we came back and we thought we ought to do something, try, try to try this recording thing. So we went to Art Shield studio, really nice guy. He complimented our, our harmonies you know, really well. When I look at uh, Dick's group, I would say Dick generally had a better band, but we had better singing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we did a lot of different kinds of music. They stuck pretty much to the Beatles after a while, you know. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, what... They really got into that. Yeah, that took him off. Did Dick tell you about Art Shield? Uh, no, um, I don't believe he did. Uh, you know, I don't recall how he got it, but I want to ask you a question before I forget. If it doesn't fit what we're talking about, they can throw it out. Yeah, in the Michigan rock and roll, is uh, Lafayette uh, Yarborough in it? He's not in the Hall of Fame, but I I know him. Very, yeah. I know of him. He's going to be a guest. Yeah, here. he's going to be on the show here coming up sometime. He should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's a he was a great yeah. entertainer. He he made such a good living in Flint and Saginaw. People came to the Forty and they say you got to hear Lafayette and the Sabers. And uh, we were thinking, well, we we got a good crowd. We don't need to go see somebody else. I went over there and I was just blown away. Uh, with how good they were. They had track, for one thing. They had tracking, you know, the background singing and stuff on tracks. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any of that. So we bought an Echolette system after we heard them. We thought we better get some modern technology. But uh, he was really good. Another one was, was uh, Chopper. Yeah, you know that name? Oh, yeah. Chopper yeah. was a killer drummer. And they had that funk family. And then another... They did a big Chopper. band thing. I remember at the old ace of clubs where the scene i think it was called yeah. at the time i saw them play one night and when i came we were on the road and i came back and they played a, a 60s set then they played a 50s set and then they came out with hi-hats on and played a 40s set yeah. and the two guitar players played trumpet with one hand and guitar with the other one and it was in the mood and stuff like that and i thought good god these guys should go big then chopper died at like yeah. 27. uh his wife and i are, are in touch yet uh you know, she was from Saginaw originally, and uh, she now lives in Ohio, I believe. But uh, uh, that was a great band. Randy Markey was one of the guitar players. Was he? Uh, that was a good a friend of mine. Band. You know, Michigan's had a lot of really great musicians. Oh, I agree. You know, that's, uh, I, I think Michigan stands up with any state in the union as far as music history. Uh, it's phenomenal. I feel so sorry for groups. I, I go into White's Bar quite often now. Just to see people coming up, there's a guy named Joe Balbo who I think is really talented, and uh, you know, fantastic. And there's yeah. you know Joe. I know Joe. Yeah. And it, it's sad because he thinks he's too old to do anything. He's 34 and he's still single. <laughs> and um, they've got to get shots in Las Vegas or California or someplace or Detroit, you know. But White's Bar, thank God, they're open because they let people get up there and at least display their talents. Yeah. And Joe's a monster player. He played at the Review Awards uh, this past Review Awards with uh, Mike Brush, too. He, he was part of the... Mike Brush had, like, an all-star thing going on and uh, a different lineup, like, for his little half hour up there. And Joe and him did two or three songs with... Well, three weeks ago, Mike Brush and I and uh, Charlie McCoy, who's probably the world's greatest harmonica player, played in Fort Myers. Uh, I saw that on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. We had a great time. Charlie McCoy, you know, he... Uh, Directed as music director of the, of the Hee Haw program for 14 years. Oh, really? He's played with Elvis oh. Presley, Bob mm -hmm. Dylan, sure. Don Steele. I mean, he's yeah, <laughs> all the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> well, Don, I want to bring you back to Art Shield. How many songs did you record with Art? You know, I think I still have the. Uh, uh, we made a tape of it. And I think I got a tape or a CD or something of it that we might have made a, t a CD out of it. But I think we did four or five songs, and I remember I had a cold when we did it. But um, it, you know, if you didn't know, you wouldn't pay much attention. Somebody digitized your your tape, your reel to reel, or your acetate. Uh, I we I think we I think I had it taken off that reel to reel stuff and put on something. Wonderful. Uh, it might still be in that form, but I've got a. I think I could find it if I look for it. Yeah, that'd be real interesting. I, you know, we were talking about uh, Roy Hockley and the Chessmen before we started the show, and Roy and this is when Joey J was with them, they recorded an album's worth of songs with Art Shield. I think it was probably they almost used it like a rehearsal. That's what it sounded like. But that's the only recorded evidence of that band that was so popular. 
Art was way ahead of his time uh, with with the recording stuff. Oh, know? he was an audiophile. Yeah, he he was, uh, and he was a very kind gentleman. You know. Do you remember the setup? Uh, no, there was a picture. There's only one picture that I've ever found of him in the studio uh, where you could actually see the control booth. Did he have the glassed in control booth in that room? Do you no. remember? No, he didn't. We were just all playing in the open and we each had our own microphone. And uh, yeah, we played right there, just set up and played like we were at a bar. You yeah. And you don't remember how you got that? recording date set up or how that came about you know i'm sorry that i, I can't remember i'm trying to think who might have told us about it but well, he advertised in the uh yellow pages though true you know so you might have just looked up recording studios you would have seen our ej and right? the echoes did a album there as well i was, just, oh, okay. I was wondering did you come off the road to do it um, yeah we yeah. were off the road and we, just and we break, thought we had like I said, we were making a lot of money and we weren't paying attention to recording. Right. And Dick Wagner and some of these guys were, were recording a lot. We thought we ought to at least take a shot at it. But we uh, later when I did the album with uh, Willie Nelson and with Tammy Wynette, uh, I really got first class yet exposure to what they what they wrote like in the studio. Uh, but that was just uh, like like this room kind of. Right. Come in and uh, he's got some stuff on the wall and a few microphones and and he put it up. Yeah. yeah. But you didn't put it on vinyl, what you recorded then, I guess, right? I, I don't think I've got it. I, I don't know. I've got it, but I, I don't know if it's on a tape or if it's on vinyl. I, I don't know. But I, I have little boxes of those tapes. I think I could find it. Yeah, because that, that was Dick's thing. You know, he, uh, he put out these 45s, and then he would go to radio stations, and he became very good friends with Dick Fabian and Bob Dyer. Yes. And... You know, he got them to play them. You know, I guess, uh, I, I did you ever hear any of the little bits that uh, Dick and the Bossman did on KNX? No, I haven't. Yeah, they had little skits that they worked out. Oh. And, you know, of course, they played a lot of the dances, so they got all kinds of airplay. Dick was very Dick. creative. Yeah. And, yeah. and he really got into the, let's, let's get on the, yeah, on the radio. He, yeah, and he, he, you know, he really was a pioneer that do-it-yourself uh, DIY, idea. Yeah. yeah, DIY. You know, that yeah. became so big in the seventies and eighties. Uh, yeah, real pioneer in that. Yeah, those are classic recordings. When you were did. running those circles, uh, were you keeping your eye on what Dick was doing all the whole time, or, or? Dick and, and our lead guitar player were from uh, both from the Lake Orion area. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Dick. I don't know if he's from Lake Orion or Clarkston, but he was that area. Right, I know it was in that general and, and, vicinity uh, and of And our Pontiac. guitar player, uh, Barry Combs, was really a good guitar player, too. Um, Barry, I thought, had more soul than Dick, but Dick had probably more chords. <laughs> yeah. more a little more chops yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Both were real good, but different well, style. For yeah. years, I used to work with Wagner in his studio. and uh, Not for years, I'm just saying now. Uh, I used to work with Dick anyway to preface this for three years when he was in Saginaw for the last time he was here in the aughts, you know. Uh, but we were always looking for and trying to find out because he could not remember the very first recording he was on. He cut it down in Detroit, and I think it came out of Motown. It was uncredited, and I'm just like, we're to this day, nobody remembers what that was. Oh, my God. Wow. Barry Combs had a song when he was like 16 in, in the Detroit area. It was called I'm in Love. No, it was called... Uh, uh, here comes a man with a horn on his head. Uh, he looks half dead. It, it was it was a play on some TV show, mm -hmm. and uh, we 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 had another guy who could have gone into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You probably never heard of Butch White. No, Butch and I played together for years. Butch, yeah. Butch, Butch should be in if he's not right because he was started the Playboys with yeah. Pete well, Dick Wood. Wagner took his place, right? Yes. Yeah, he should be in. Uh, Pete Wooden is probably in. And he oh, yeah, with the Bossman. Well, the problem is uh, with Lafayette and Butch is it's a voted in. And so a lot of people, you know, since they didn't put out a lot of records or anything like that. Yeah, he probably you should know, have an they, honorary group. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a possibility, too. Uh, yeah, because... You know, it makes it very difficult if you're not, you know, if you were playing in bars and so on, you didn't get that general. Yeah, this is a little off the track, but when uh, I was on the uh, Sports Hall of Fame in Saginaw for about three years, and I thought I could get on this, you know, it didn't work. 
um, I had to do more on the football field than I did, or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was on, I was on that board, and it was um, like I'll just use a couple of examples. I played with Al Luplo, who was an All American. Oh yes, I was the other halfback. You know, so I remember this the other halfback. Yeah, right. but but Al was a great football player, and and he would be in anybody's Hall of Fame in Michigan. You know, you know. Um, where I was going, where I was going with that was, I can't remember where I was going with that. Uh, oh, a, a guy like uh, Bruce Nikuski, uh played ahead of me. He was like four or five years ahead of me. But Bruce started as a freshman in baseball, basketball, and football, and was all state in all three sports, I believe. Never made the Hall of Fame because he went to Michigan State on a scholarship and didn't play, didn't mm -hmm. play much. But some of these guys that had great high school careers should be recognized for that. You know. Well, I thought that that's what these, like the Bay City Hall of Fame or the Saginaw Hall of Fame, would take that into consideration. That they would, they're voting on, you know, like they they have in Bay County or Bay City. You have sports teams. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they were state champs, or uh, I'm trying to think of some other. Yeah, they do that in Saginaw too. But yeah, they they put a lot of attention on. Did you go beyond yeah, high school? Right. And there was a lot of great athletes that didn't go beyond high school for maybe they didn't have a gray matter, or they didn't care or didn't want to. Or right. Did couldn't afford it maybe. Yeah. Well, and it, you know you're going to a different level too, you know. So you can be a tremendous player in high school, but you go to college and everybody there was a tremendous high school player and so yeah you can you can get lost in the shuffle no oh, doubt. well that rock and roll hall of fame first i want to commend you that's a great idea well thank you and uh if i get on the board can i get in it <laughs> i keep trying you know? okay. <laughs> <laughs> well maybe you can get an award for pers persistence <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah that's awesome let's work at it <laughs> So Art Shield, you you recorded that and did nothing with the recording. Didn't promote it. Didn't put a forty-five out. Nothing. No, we did nothing with it. Uh, you know, we played it a few times and then went back on the road. You know, it was like. Uh, you, you didn't have management or anything, did you? No, I, so I was the manager. You were the manager. So you were so busy doing your thing and keeping the wheels on the road that yeah. the focus had to go in other directions a lot. Yeah, and, and we were booked almost a year out. Oh, you know? geez, yeah. So, and I'd go back to school and, uh, you know, and spend a semester there. And uh, then I'd go back out, come back, and they'd introduce something like new math, which I was back to a lot of math, and I, I was completely lost. I remember I talked to one Dr. Atkins, a woman, and I said, you know, I, I need to drop this class. I, I don't understand the set theory or whatever you're talking about. And she said, well, you could join the Army. And I thought, well, that's good counseling. Yeah, wow. Uh, <laughs> On the real. Thanks. Thanks. thanks yeah, nice suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. So you, you went back out on the road. That was done. What was the next stage of your uh, of your musical career? Well, I came back to Saginaw, and uh, it started uh, teaching school. And I, I started out as a traveling phys ed teacher. And my my income went from like twenty five thousand a year to like fifty seven hundred, <laughs> yeah. and so I, I got, got a hold of uh, Mitch Berlin and uh, some guys, and, and we formed a band, and I played three or four nights a week. Jerry Greenwald played with me, and uh, Butch White, Mitch Berlin, and I played with Buzz Ashton for a while, and uh, Dick Dumas, and like you said, a lot of different groups, and we frequently had a different name, but. Um, they were all in that rock and roll uh, genre. Well, but, you know, and that was a great time too because there were probably a lot of venues that had live music. And they played. So, yeah, it's so different from today. Was Buzz Ashton from Cleveland? No, Buzz was uh, Buzz was from Grayling. Oh. But uh, they had that one band, they had Roland Burke, and I think Roland was from Ohio. Okay, because I remember seeing him was in a band at the Horseshoe. On Sundays, they were, uh, they played more than Sundays, but the Sunday afternoon was a big deal at the Jake Tribe's Horseshoe. And then the next thing I know, he's living in Saginaw or in the area, and I thought, I remember him, because that was a great group. I can't remember the name of it. Um, the bass player stuck around too. Yeah, I, I should know the name of that, because I, I, we play, a, they'd come to see us on Thursdays at the Fort Lee, we go see them on Sundays. 
and they sit in. But uh, Buzz was a, a really good musician, and um, his wife Renee that he has now, uh, he's been married to her a long time. She's a delight, and uh, he was married like I think four times. But uh, this one was a good one. They've been married a long time, um, and he was playing up until recently. He's got trouble, I think, arthritis in his hands or something like that. I passed up a lot of guitar players simply because I don't have arthritis. I haven't improved. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just got pathetically worse. Yeah, I remember Buzz Ashton, and they were comparing him to uh, Dick Wagner a yeah, lot. Yeah, I, I think Dick was, like, like Barry, I think Dick was a better guitar player than Buzz, but Buzz was really good. And Buzz was the first guy I played with that played every song exactly like the record, as close as he could get. Ah. Ours was always close enough, it's good enough, or let's do it our way, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But Buzz liked to play it like the, like the album. I'm taking a step back, and I forgot to ask this earlier, when you did go to record at Shields, was, did you write the songs? Who wrote the music? No. Were you doing covers? We were doing covers at that time. I've written a lot of songs since then, but at that time we were doing all covers. Okay, because I'm was, i I'm get, I'm gathering that a lot of your stuff was just doing covers and going on the road doing a cover show. Yeah, we did uh, come a little bit closer. I mean, that's one of the songs uh -huh, we uh -huh. did there. And we had a group for a while. I had a, a group called the Piano Keys. It was a black and white group. Bobby Parker was from uh, Saginaw High, and we played baseball in the summer together, and he had two buddies. And they and we took songs like "Come a Little Bit Closer" and made it almost Motown like, and we played uh, the college circuit, and that was that was a lot of fun. And Bobby once said the, that that uh, you know when you're drunk your real personality comes out, but his came out when he pulled a knife on a guy at Michigan State, oh, and so uh, that killed that girl. That it didn't kill anybody, but it killed the band. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. Well, that that her. pretty much if you were doing "Come a Little Bit Closer," that pretty much narrows down the year that you were there. That would have been probably 64 or 65. Yeah, right That's when it was a big hit, yeah. yeah. Jay and the Americans, I think. Did yes, that. Yeah. definitely. We did a lot of that, Caramia Y, and things of that sort. Uh, good harmony, and Barry would sing so hard rock. I was kind of were you, Could you do the Jay Black part? I, mean, I could at that time. Okay, yeah, wow. I can do. You're pretty impressive. I, I can do half of Jay Black and half of Roy Orbison today, you know. Yeah. Until the third elevation, and then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that would, that, I, I got to believe that would have been really popular. Uh, oh, that was the, big yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, people love that stuff. Yeah, and 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 we had really good singing, um, in, in the group. I mean, Barry was a good singer. Dick was a drummer and sang high harmony, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. He was unusual. Uh, you know, he had a little show of his own going on all the time <laughs> we played. He'd do stupid <laughs> things like somebody would be dancing with a girl that he was kind of chasing and. He'd bounce a drumstick off his head, and they go, "Whoops!" It slipped. And the guy would pick it up and hand it to him. You know? <laughs> Dick was funny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dick would do funny stuff. Yeah, I remember seeing you guys at the Fordney. Oh yeah, that's wow. Everybody else, uh, they, you know, like I said on that video, I, you know, I said that. When we played at uh, John Siski's house, it was an invitational party. He was a former state senator. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike Brush and I and, and uh, Charlie McCoy played. And uh, one of the guys said, you know, when, we were, when you were in Las Vegas, we went out there and people, were, the girls were throwing their panties and bras on stage. <laughs> and I said, uh, they really weren't. Uh, they did that with Elvis and Tom Jones maybe, but we weren't in that, <laughs> that kind of a thing yet. And they said, well, do they still do that today? And I said, uh, depends. Depends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, my uh, my groupies are in their sixties and up. That's <laughs> yeah, funny. So. <laughs> so you were you were school teacher at this point now, and you're you're going you put a little band together, start doing more shows. I started playing three nights a week. Yeah, we were at the Green Onion Room, and uh, we we would stay a long time wherever we went. It seemed you know it went. Uh, Went, uh, you know, we we play and we had we had good sounds and just keep keep going. What, did, what kind of music were you playing at this point? I and mean, this has had to be early seventies. Yeah, that'd be in the seventies. Yeah. Um, you know, Mitch liked to do things like "Hold On, I'm Coming," uh, any sax song we would do, mm -hmm. and Mitch could sing pretty well too. Um, real good sax player. Jerry Halesco was another sax player we played with. I don't know if you remember him or not. Bass any guy. Hmm. Real good. He had a mellow uh, sax. Uh, Mitch was more crass, you know, 
blaring saxophone. Um, Jerry played with a polka band and for years, and then he he would sit in with us, and he had a really mellow sound. I wonder if uh, he his sons are the golfers. There's a couple of the Jalisco boys that are top-notch golfers. Well, I don't know, but Jeff Jalisco plays around here uh, quite often. He lives in Florida. Yeah, he played with me recently. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah he was good. on a bill with me last year. He's a good friend of mine. He plays well. Uh, you know, he's got uh, a good repertoire, plays nice guitar. Yeah. Uh, nice kid, too. So you guys were probably playing a lot of songs that were very danceable, I'm guessing. Yeah, really. Yeah, danceable. I mean, you know, that was a big scene in the, the 60s and 70s. I, even into the 80s, you know, people get out on the dance floor. That's kind of a l little bit lost now. You don't see mm -hmm. that that much. Well, Bobby's book, you know, when the kids stopped dancing. Uh, Daniel's Den, they didn't have dancing. They, you know, they, they people stand there and nod their head, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And clap. You know, they, they really had a good time, but the dancing stopped. Yeah, and it, well, even Rolaire, you know, which had a, a large group of kids, that was more of a scene where... Uh, people were milling around and listening to the band and socializing. I don't remember very much dancing at, at Roller either, and they had so where's hundreds Roller? Was of... Was that Bay City? Yeah, that was the open-air uh, roller rink. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if you ever ran into Bob. Well, these were educators. Uh, Bob Darby and his wife. And um, Did and... Bob play guitar and sing in school quite a bit? Or I don't think so. Bob was just uh, into it for the business. Uh, you know, oh. you know, he was in the profession of poverty too. Teachers, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. so you know, you had to find some extra income. He coached swimming too. Yes, he was a swimming well, coach. You, and you uh, guys probably know Ed Langenberg. Oh, certainly. Ed and I were roommates in college. Oh, really? Okay. I saw him recently, and he's he t came up to me, and and I was going to speak to the our old fraternity group. We were fraternity brothers, and he said uh, his wife and you know, brought him over, and he said, I, "I'm just forgetting everything these days." So when I got up to speech, uh, speak, I said, Ed told me that he has this terrible problem with memory. And I said, how long have you had this problem? And he said, what problem? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, Ed uh, worked as, uh, I don't know what you would call him a bouncer, but he was one of the adult uh, supervisors at Band Canyon. Again, you know, doing extra, making extra money. Well, Band Canyon was, of course, Bay City's teen nightclub. And Ed was third in the nation in wrestling one year. Oh, really? Yeah, he was a great wrestler. He's about 6'1 and weighed 147, so he had great... Long arms. So and one night when I was playing at the log cabin bar, a guy came up and accused me of something, uh, looking at his wife probably or something, and, and I wasn't. Uh, you know, I, I did notice that she had a couple of teeth missing, but, <laughs> but uh, the guy came up and he said, I want you outside. <laughs> I said, you got to wait till break time, pal. <laughs> and Ed came over and says, leave him alone. And the guy said, I want you outside. That was a big mistake. Because Ed took him outside in about two seconds, had him in a banana split and just beat the crap out of the guy. <laughs> He'd have been much better off there. Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric Kitsch. Located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. They offer new and used records, including local to Michigan original vinyl and CDs, as well as clothing, electronic equipment, funky household items, music gear, and stringed instrument repair. You can find them on the web or call 989-402-1411. Didn't you own the uh, Hidden Hollow for a minute? Yeah, I did. I was part of uh, like an eight-man group that owned it. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, we had some really good, uh, I was the band when it started out. And then when I took over as manager of the place. Uh, well, I saw Bob Seeger there. Yeah, we brought we brought in, uh, Buzz Ashton was the first group. Uh, he just took the rest of my band and Buzz became me. Okay. And that was an improvement. But we had, <laughs> uh, you know, Buzz was very, very good. And he had Dick Dumas and another guy. Then he formed a group called Brian Paul Thomas. I remember and that. They were real good. And Bob Seeger came in there, but he came in after I was in the ownership. Okay. Um, yeah. So w was that like early 70s? It yeah. had to be early 70s. Okay. Yeah, yeah before Seeger really took off big yeah. time. Yeah. You wouldn't be playing. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I remember people telling me that the dishes were breaking in the kitchen and everything else because it was so loud compared to what they were used to. Yeah. I think at that time he had that drummer that was... Yeah, I had two Pe bass drums. Pepperine, yeah. Pepperine, yeah. Pepperine, right? Yeah. You know, I, you know, I'm a, uh, you know, I really uh, enjoy Bob Seger's music. I think he does did oh, a killer job all his yeah. time. Yeah, and they kind of regionalized him for a long time. 
Right? But uh, then it took finally, a long time. He about 11 big. years before he really broke big. Yeah, he did Hollywood Nights, and that helped him out a little bit. Yeah, you know? oh, Night Moves. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So what were you doing at that time period when Bob broke loose? Uh, I was probably superintendent of schools by then. Oh, yeah? Yeah, uh, you know, I was only seven years in the school district when I became superintendent. So um, no one was more surprised than my parents at that time. But then I went to Toledo, Ohio. My wife and I said she wanted to move south. She didn't like the south. <laughs> and so I moved to Seattle. I became superintendent in Seattle. She didn't like the north either. So she's my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I how tried. did you, what got you into administration? It was funny. Uh, I was offered the coaching job at St. Andrews, where I had played. Mm-hmm. And then they offered it to somebody else. And they said, like, yeah, you're going to be our coach. And so I'm all set. And when they hired somebody else, I said, the hell with it. I'm going to go get my master's degree. And I, I went on and got my master's degree. Is that when you went to Ohio State? Uh, no, that was Central Michigan. Oh, you went at, at CMU. Okay. And then when I when I came back, uh, being a traveling phys ed teacher, I was at Central Office. So while I was low man on the totem pole, but I started writing curriculum. I wrote a curriculum, critical health issues curriculum, and I wrote one for the traveling phys ed department. Everybody was doing different things, and so I, you know, I was a good writer. Mm-hmm. So I wrote that curriculum. And Jim Adams, who was the deputy superintendent, really liked me. And he called me one time and he said, you know, somebody threatened to kill the principal at Nell Haley and we're trying to find somebody expendable. <laughs> Would you be interested in that job? <laughs> and I was community education director at the time, which was a great job. I was going around setting up shows and doing stuff like that. So, <laughs> so I became principal at Nell Haley. Oh, wow. And then uh, went away to do my doctorate in 72, 72 and 73. Came back as assistant superintendent for elementary and then... Uh, about a year and a half later, uh, the superintendent left, and I, I was named superintendent. Now, this is in Saginaw? Or? Saginaw. Okay, wow. Then Toledo and then Seattle. What prompted you to make the move out of Saginaw? Was, it, was the money much better? Or? Yeah, the money in Toledo is a bigger system. Okay. And they have big problems, so Ohio State really pushed me to take it. And then I went to Seattle, which was a long ways away, you know, and uh, much better city. Uh, I, I, it was, Seattle was very, very liberal, more liberal than, than I was used to, mm-hmm. you know. One school board member said the happiest day of her life was when her son uh, ran away to Canada. And, uh, <laughs> Avoid the draft. Yeah. <laughs> I had another friend who I introduced his, he said I had a war bride, and I was expecting him to bring in a Japanese lady, and he says, oh, no, she's from Canada. <laughs> that was his war <laughs> uh, that's great <laughs> well uh yeah. now, when you were out in seattle were you still playing music yeah that's when i did the album with tammy winnette uh, really well, how did that yeah you got to tell us how did yeah. that come about that's an amazing story it really mm-hmm. is uh i was playing i was sitting in with ira allen and uh his his wife was Molly B. I don't know if you remember. Oh, certainly, and Tennessee Ernie Ford. Yeah, right. she could really sing, and uh, and Ira had a really good band. And when I went out there, he had a, a little thing, so a, a thing that was on TV called "So You Want to Be a Star." And so I went out to see him. He invited me up on stage. Molly and I got to be good friends, and so I'd sit in with them quite a bit. And Cheryl Arnold and the Blue Mariah was another group that I got in contact with. And the school board said to me uh, halfway through my first year, the Previous superintendents have always had house parties where they ask for money, and my house was chaotic. I mean, we had a lot of kids around, and they're all involved in sports and stuff. I said, I don't want to do that. And our business guy, uh, Dick Fuller, a great guy, he said, uh, you know, you play guitar and sing, you ought to do an album. If you could sell 10,000 albums at $10 a piece, you would generate $100,000. Interest rates were over 10% at that time. Uh, you'd have that $10,000 a year without ever doing anything more. So it was his idea. So Les Paul and Danny Kay, remember Danny Kay? He yes, had a studio me. in uh, uh, Seattle. We went in there and uh, Bach and Turner Overdrive were recording. And uh, um, I didn't even have a band, except I could use one of the two bands. And uh, Cheryl Arnold said, you know, if you're gonna do mostly country music, when I turned 40, I thought nobody's gonna be in their 50s and 60s playing rock and roll. Wrong. Yes. Uh, now you can be in now your you, 90s. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 
<laughs> so I, I had always liked country, and I went country and, and Americana type stuff. I like good songs with a story. Harlan Howard once told me, you know, he, he always said the country music's three chords and a good story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've gotten a fourth and fifth chord by now, but bottom line <laughs> is that's the essence of most country songs. And um, so we, we, we it, it went from her recommending I meet Danny Knutson, who was a great songwriter for George Jones and Tammy Wynette, people like that. I didn't know that at the time. I met this little guy at the airport and he said, Don, I could write songs, but I, I couldn't produce the album, you know. But I know a guy, we went to see Jerry Taylor, who another guy who became a great friend. And uh, then they, they both worked for George Ritchie. And so they, they said, we have to hear you sing I'm, I'm covering a lot of territory faster, but they took me on to Printer's Alley, which was the big place at that time. I think it still is, isn't it? And no, Broadway Nashville? is kind of the, the bigger place now, Broadway oh, okay. Street. All right. So uh, I went in there, and there's two gals look like they, they were called the Juma Sisters, and they were they were uh, Danny Knutson's uh, nieces, and they looked like they'd been spray painted. And I'm standing there in a in a in a three piece suit or something with you know wingtip shoes. <laughs> And I go up there and I, I sang a song and it went went over real well. And, and the one genie says, uh, are you from Seattle? And I said, how would you know that? And she said, well, my ex-husband's the weatherman in Seattle and they're all talking about this singing superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> they all loved it except the school board wasn't wild about it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so then they took me over to George Ritchie's house and he called the union and said they want to do this album for scholarships and would you do it at union rates? And they said, as long as he's not doing it to, to raise his money for himself, we, yeah, we'd do that. So then this beautiful blonde comes down the steps and it's Tammy Wynette, that, that was his wife. Hmm. And I had no idea. They didn't mention it. They just assumed I knew that, I guess, but wow. I didn't. And then uh, we... Uh, they knew, they knew I could sing well enough, and, and they said, uh, we got to write this album. So Jerry Taylor, Denny, and I sat down, and in eight hours wrote the whole album, the concept album. Wow. And uh, I was basically the story behind it, and they, they were really good at rhyming stuff and coming in with ideas. And uh, so we laid the tracks for that. Tammy listened to it. I got a call that Tammy said that she would uh, do that duet on Dream Away with you. I can give you copies of that album. Oh, man. Oh, man. So, what year is this? Yeah. Uh, that, that was in 1983. Jeez. And uh, the album sold almost a half million copies. Hmm. What's the name of the record? It's called uh, Let's All Pull Together. But the, the the thing I did with Tammy Wynette was called Dream Away. It's still producing, I think, seventeen thirty five hundred dollars scholarships a year in Seattle. Wow. Jeez, that's fantastic. Seattle Scholarship wow. Fund. It, it's wonderful. Three years later... Um, Willie, uh, Connie Nelson got a hold of the priest and the priest called me. Catholic Charities wanted to do a fundraiser. And she said, would Don be interested if I could get Willie to sing with him? And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty famous. Have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yes. You know. <laughs> so, so I got, I went out and uh, went to uh, Austin, Texas and, and uh, hung out with Willie for a long time, watching him make the movie, The Red-Headed Stranger, Preacher's oh. Wife, I think it was called. Yeah. And I made a big contribution because he couldn't remember which leg was supposed to be crippled. I told him, put a stone in your shoe. He says, that, 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 that'll do it. You know. <laughs> yeah. But he, he was there, Daryl Royal was uh, was there. And uh, so that that album was for Catholic Charities and went very well too. What year was that? That was about 86 or 87. A couple years later, okay. Yeah. Now you did a, a duet with Willie? Yeah, yeah, uh, one called uh, those healing hands of time. I think he wrote that song about his son. He didn't tell me that, but his son had committed suicide, Billy. Mm. And uh, those healing hands of time, it sounds like somebody broke up with you. You know, it, it sounded a little more like that, but I think it was really about a son. Yeah. Boy, what a thrill to be able to really? sing with a couple of country music legends like well, Tammy Wynette and After I did that, I did lead Willie shows. Elson. Lead shows for Merle Haggard and Roy Jeez. Clark and did a lot of shows with Roy Clark and, and uh, I, I did just put me on a whole new path, and and uh, it was really fun. Uh, they had a lot of offers to just quit what I was doing and go out there, but I'm a doctor, you know, and I thought I'm legitimate here, and a musician, and I'm not really legitimate. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I can play okay, but I'm not Roy Clark or or any of those guys. So, did you ever find yourself nowadays on YouTube? 
uh, playing or singing with them anywhere? Is there any clips up anywhere or any bits with you with these people? It's it's so long ago. I mean, uh, that was in the eighties. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube from the eighties and nineties. I don't know. Uh, yeah, there there well could be. be. Yeah. There could be. I've got hmm. pictures of Willie and I, and I got pictures of Tammy and I. Um, and but you know, when we did when we did the album, the Tammy album, there must have been fifty cameras there from all over the country because it really it was the first time anybody. Here's a here's an interesting story for you guys. The first one I talked to about producing the album, I, we had to find somebody to produce the album. And before I met Danny Knutson and all that, um, Quincy Jones graduated from Seattle High School. He graduated from Garfield High School. So did Bruce Lee and uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. I mean, that school graduated a lot of famous people. But I talked to Quincy Jones and he said, well, I'm doing an album with uh, Michael Jackson. I'm doing an album with uh, uh, Barbara Streisand and I, I really don't have time for that. <laughs> Now I make a quantum leap here, but we put that album out. He knew what we we're gonna do. Uh, we put the album out to raise money for kids, and about two years later, he did "We Are the World," and I think we, I think the germ of the idea came from our album. There you wow. go. That's true. That? True. Yeah. Huh. I really do think wow. that. Wow. Uh, he would probably deny that, and he's he's got oh. deniability, you know. But uh, yeah. but you can see that he saw if if Don Skill could do that, you know, he's, he's an yeah. unknown and he's a school superintendent. What the hell could I do if I brought in all these stars and did something in We Have the World? It was a marvelous project. How long uh, did you stay? Was that the end of your career at, as a superintendent in uh, in Seattle, or did you move on? No, I no, I start. I I resigned in Seattle and started my own business. Bought a desk and a credenza, and it took me about six months to make my first sale, and I sold my desk and credenza. Um, because I wasn't getting any business, you know, I thought I would. But I had spoken to Lou Tice and the Pacific Institute every year when I was superintendent. I really liked them. They were in the personal empowerment business, and I was trained in psychology. So I said I philosophy and psychology. So I talked to Lou, and I joined the Pacific Institute, and I was there for about five years. Then I started my own business uh, called Performance Learning, Inc. Still have it. And uh, we're in Saginaw now. I never thought I'd come back because I went from Seattle to California, I lived in, in Huntington Beach for nine years, and then I moved over to Las Vegas and then to Scottsdale. And I say, I've been preparing for the afterlife. I keep going to hotter and hotter places. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then a few years ago, I, a few years ago, I came back here uh, to write the, a book about the Shepler family. And then I wrote a book about John Hall, Glass Tender. And now I just finished one on Terry DuPerrin. And I got my first review from Amazon right there on that piece of paper. I wanted you to read it. Oh, okay. So I'll leave it here for you. Excellent. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's been a good ride. I've had a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. Did a lot of work in Las Vegas. And you're still playing. Still playing. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't want to have a group and play Thursday, Friday, and Saturday or anything like that anymore. But I. I liked. I you know sit you know Donnie Brown practices out at our place mm -hmm. with uh, Scott Vandell, who's a great guitar player. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Walla Gangas, you know, Louie. Yeah, their new band's pretty awesome. They're, yeah. they're real good. In fact, he's got two bands, one called uh, Stone Street Revival and the other one's Claim Jumpers. Hmm. A lot of overlap in the two groups, but they're both really good. Uh, Donnie works them hard, and, uh, and they're good musicians. Um, Where's your place? Where do you, where, are you a studio? Yeah, if you ever want to come out there, y'all you, uh, you come out. It's uh, right across the old Channel 5 building. Uh, Terry DuPerrin has a big place there and he had a big garage and when I came in he said what I said if, if we do anything together uh, I, I want to have music be a part of it so all these bands practice we don't charge them anything for it we bought all the equipment set up so that they don't have to bring anything with them if they don't want to if you guys were to stop out tomorrow or, or Saturday uh, Larry McRae and his new group they got an album coming out next week and uh, they're going to do a European tour. Yeah, have you heard Larry McRae play? Oh, yeah. certainly oh, yeah. many times. He's yeah. been on our show, too. Yeah, he's uh, yeah. dynamite. Yeah, I was his manager for early. Were you? Ma a magnificent musician. Mm -hmm. Their their band is is really all about all about uh, Larry. That's great. Yeah, as, as it should be. Yeah. You know, he's a star blues man. Mm -hmm. So he's going to Europe soon? Uh, they, this summer. Oh, uh, they okay. apparently have a couple dates set up. and I introduced him to the best, best, best how do you say it, 
Bethesda uh, Jazz Club. I know the owner of that in Maryland, and um, I gave him, gave him all the materials on that stuff. Do you have any gigs uh, set up yet, Don? Or uh, we're, we we have a committee now of planning when we're going to do this event. It's hard to do a like an event what like we want to do because there's so many other fundraisers, the walks and the okay. the different things. You don't want to walk on anybody else's. Right, territory. so this is this is a fundraising thing. Yeah, it's that a fundraising you're do. thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see Saginaw on stage had their. Um, who's going to play at it this year? I saw. I it just on got Facebook. invited. I just got invited to perform there. Oh, it's really? going to be the end of April. Yeah. What do you? Didn't you just record an album at Bobby Ginnigensky's? Yeah, that's the Mustard Seed Chowder album. Oh, okay. Yeah, Bobby did a great job, by the way. We have a drummer that I'd like you all to hear. His name is Josh Pajak. And he, he played, uh, he's out of Highland, Michigan, or that area. And he played in the School of Rock from the time he was like eight years old. Oh, okay, yeah. And then he went to school, of, he went to Berkeley School of Music, and uh, they paid him $35,000 a semester to go there. And he's from, you know, low, low level, uh, financially. Uh, yeah, Highland is not, you know. I've, I brought him in, and Bobby's been recording for God knows how long. And he said, I've never had a drummer as good as him. Wow. Hmm. And I told Donnie Brown, we didn't use Donnie. Donnie's kind of the local, you know, recording guy. Yeah, that local everybody wants to use. On yeah, Brown. certainly. Mm -hmm. Him or Steve McRae. Yeah, and yeah. So, I, so I didn't use Donnie on the, on the album, but I, uh, I, you know, I said, you got to hear this guy, Donnie. And, and Donnie says, well, yeah, I'd like to hear him. Where's he from? He says, I said, Highland. And he says, oh, my God, I've seen the kid. He's phenomenal. So they're paying for his master's degree, and he's going to do that in one year so out of Berkeley. But. They have a jazz band that travels all over the world, and he's the drummer they chose for that. He can play any kind of music. Wow, that's wow. something but else. Bobby Ganagueski fell in love with him because he came in and did about eight songs in one night off the tracks. And uh, he said, listen, Bobby said, listen to the things overnight, come back in if you want to do anything over. And when he came in the morning, he said, I'm going to do it all over. He said, I listen to everything really carefully. I can do better. So Bobby fell in love with him right there. You know, Bob's right. a perfectionist. So mm -hmm. Two yeah. perfectionists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I got uh, EJ and the Echoes back at uh, Bobby's studio about 10 years ago. Yeah. Then couldn't get him back in again to finish it because now I guess EJ. Yeah, he's got, got a lot of well. problems. A lot of problems. Cancer and I think he's got some dementia going on. I'm a psychologist. I, most of my friends have dementia. Most of my friends have dementia. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> One of the big signs is repeating stories over and over again. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, man. So after you did your um, your Willie and Tammy thing in the 80s, what, what took you through the 90s into the aughts? Well, when I was with the Pacific Institute, when I started my own company, I still affiliated with them. Uh, we had a place up in Twist, Washington, where we brought in, I played with Reba McIntyre and, and Merle Haggard and Roy Clark and Hoyt Axton. Hoyt Axton and I became really good friends. He drank about a gallon of wine before he'd perform and it, it never showed. <laughs> you know, he was, he was really uh, great to uh, play with. But, uh, you know, uh, most of the time, I would I would use Cheryl Arnold's group or, or um, Ira Allen's group. Where was this at? It, this was in Twist, Washington, which is Eastern Washington. Beautiful ranch. And and all those country artists you just mentioned, that you'd you'd play with them when they came up there. So you'd they back came them? up there, and uh, and then sometimes they would say we'd, we'd like to use you in California or wherever, and we we'd go over there and play. Okay, so you did you stayed on the West Coast, but you would back bands. Occasionally. Pretty much on the pretty much on the West Coast. Really? Yeah. Oh, with Tammy Wynette, uh, we played New York. I couldn't believe how strong the uh, the country audience is in New York. I I didn't think there would be anybody show up, but we'd go to a restaurant and everybody knew her. And... Well, she was, I mean, was she, she was what, late 50s, early 60s when she started out? Uh, she's probably started out in the 60s. Mm -hmm. she, she died at 57. Oof. Um, You know, she was just a delightful gal. I, had, I heard a lot of her records growing up. My dad was a huge time in it for Yeah, that divorce and... Stand by your man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> apartment number nine. Yeah, that was the first one she did, apartment <laughs> yeah. number nine. Yeah. Yeah, those were all... Let me see. That was late 60s, I think, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It would have been 68, 69. Is that one? 
those came out? You know, good question. I, I'm yeah. not sure. When you went to New York, were there, this had to be after, you recorded in 83, so that would have been 84 probably that you played with her? Yeah, 84, 85 probably. I, I, okay, so you, you did specific shows. Um, were they based around that record that, that you did with her, or were they just kind of uh, her they greatest hit? They would do their evenings? show and then say, we're going to bring up Dr. Don Steele. He's, he did an album. We, we were a part of it, and we'd sell albums there. Oh, really? And, uh, you know, they'd sell their albums. Uh, so you, you, got, you get to get in the autograph line and do your thing, too, then? Eh? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So you may very well be on YouTube for some of these videos for the bigger shows when they went coast to coast and stuff. Could be. That'd I, be kind of cool to I track down. I have no down, idea. Huh? Sure. Yeah, if you can find me, yeah, let me know. Uh, you, uh, we, had Bob, <laughs> we had Bob Hausler on a show, and Bob's done some gigs with uh, Merle Haggard, and I spent so much time combing Merle Haggard shows in the 80s when he said he did. Bob says, I saw two of them. I'm like, I can't find you anywhere. He goes, I ain't telling you where they're at, but I'm on two of them. I'm Merle, like, wow. If you go on Amazon, uh, Dream Away, I mean, if you go on YouTube, Dream Away, uh, ask for a Dream Away sung by Tammy Wynette or by Don Steele to come up under either name. But it's on Amazon. I mean, on YouTube. Excellent. Is there a video or is it just the recording? Because just I know, the recording. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I was yeah, you know, but I was talking about Bobby and in a video performing live with him on stage. You know, right. like finding finding these clips of you guys when you're yeah. playing out live. That's kind of cool. But most of the recordings for everything you can get on YouTube or Amazon. Oh yeah, Amazon, I mean, yeah. yeah, it's absolutely amazing yeah. what you can find on YouTube. Willie was Willie was great to and that was no one uh, Merle not so much. Uh, you know, he was first he drank a ton mm -hmm. and he was kind of surly. And uh, Willie, you know, if, if you know, the band would joke like, "What has three, you know, three teeth and IQ of ninety, whole front row of Willie Nelson concert?" They get there at two o'clock in the afternoon, and we don't start till nine. You know, <laughs> they would joke about that. I got another story I got to tell you off the air, but um, it's uh, Willie. You know, was he's just very funny, great listener. And did you go perform a lot with Willie too? Did you go yeah, around? Yeah, we did quite a few. Yeah? Yeah, he, he was, um, Willie, you know, does a big, long, long show usually. And, yeah. Uh, he doesn't sing nearly as well as he used to, N none of us do, but he still plays really good guitar. He's got that style of, of his own. Uh, Charlie McCoy was telling me, I said, who's the hardest guy to play with? He said, Willie, there's no breaks. I mean, he's singing or he's playing. I always thought, I, I told, uh, Larry today, I said, I'd like to coach B.B. King for a while. He said, oh, <laughs> not guitar. I like to teach him to sing and play at the same time. You know, I went to the store, blah, 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 blah. then I came home, blah, blah, blah. you know, he never sings while oh, he's yeah. playing. Right. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I love the, I love musical talent. And uh, um, I, I think I made my living pretty much by being a decent singer, probably a uh, very average guitar player, but a good MC. You know, I, I kept the show going mm -hmm. and uh, was happy to have other people highlighted. I had a friend of mine, Marlon Wilson, who attended, I guess it would, would you call them training sessions? Or uh, it, it, I, didn't, I, I didn't really talk to him too long. I just saw him, he, would, he had found an album uh, that I was looking for that I wanted to display. And uh, I mentioned that, you know, you were coming on the podcast. And he said, oh, I went to a, a class or was it like maybe a class on public speaking? What, uh, is that, would that accurate? I, I did a lot of motivational speaking. Maybe it was motivational, so yeah. Uh, Sparks was a, was a lady that, uh, Sally Sparks, or her, name, her last name was Sparks, that took care of uh, the, the guy from the Empire showroom. Uh, what's his name? The one you brought up. Oh, uh, Roy Hockley? Yeah, she was the guy that got really behind him and did a lot of stuff to help him, you know, get booked in other places. And I think it was Sally Sparks. Okay. But, uh, but anyways, have, this this guy said he had attended something that you had run. Um, well, I did a lot of seminars. Okay. Probably yeah. attended seminars. Yeah, that was yeah. probably it. Yeah, I do a lot of seminars. Because um, he asked me if you had any 45s for sale. He's a big <laughs> collector of Michigan 45s, oh. so I I can ask I can assure him that uh, you didn't have any 45s from no. when you were recorded with Art Shield. No. Okay, so we could maybe make one, but we don't <laughs> yeah, have any. Right. Pretend. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well. Well, 
Thank you so much for coming on the show and doing oh, this with us, yeah, Don. It's been a great, pleasure man. to have you and have a self, to hear so the backstory. Yeah. yeah, you're so all invited fun. to come out to where. where oh we, man, uh, that really sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Look and, oh. uh, and you're on Facebook, right? The people can track you down and see oh, what yeah. you're up to. Oh, yeah, and Performance Learning Inc. dot com is my website. Website. Oh, I want to add that to our preview. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, guy. Really nice meeting you. Thank you okay. Man. Great careers. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All of you. Yeah. Fantastic. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week posted every weekend. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredrife.com and the electric kitsch at electrickitch.com. This podcast wouldn't be here without special help from Studio 163's Alan Garcia, our podcast videographer and wingman, Mr. Mike Beatty, MMHP tagline specialist, Mr. Eddie Switek, and of course, Gary Johnson, Fred Reif, the electric kitsch, and all of our special guests, and especially you listeners. We want to thank you. You've been listening to the MMHP and the 989. From all of us at the podcast, we want to thank you for tuning in. Do you remember? Well, I know you do. Mitch Berlin's band. Uh, Mitch Berlin and I played together for years. I know it. Yeah. Uh, who's the lead uh, guy there? That's Sam. Sam. So, so yeah. was that? Was Sam the, the California part of it? Yeah. Well, he was from... He wasn't from California, I don't believe, but he played saxophone and sang like Ray Charles. Oh. And uh, he wasn't a great sax player. I think Mitch was a better sax player. Gary Moscow, I still talk to regularly. He's in here. Oh, he's in that the, Yeah, he'd be, he'd be one of these four, I'm sure, probably up there. I can't. Because I knew he was in the group, but I... It was Gary Moscow, Phil Parker. Phil and I played together for a long time. We both I met Phil a long people. time ago. Yeah, yeah, there's Mitch and Phil. Um, that's Eddie Byer and Gary Musso. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and there, there, uh, well, <laughs> one interesting thing about that is we both signed with Artist Corporation of America. Yeah. Who, was the drummer in, who was the drummer again? Phil Parker. Oh, Phil Parker, right. Phil Parker was the drummer. Gary Musso was lead guitar. All right. Eddie Byer played organ. Eddie Byer. And uh, Bishop Lynn played.